Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Celebrate Recovery. I'm Jamie. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. Hey, um, I suffer from anxiety. Um, Public speaking, I get nervous. Um, I also struggle with my will to quit smoking, which is funny because um, the anxiety I have when I do that, I think it's taking it away, and it is not. So if you could pray for me, for the Lord to take that from me, because I need to give him the wheel. Um, let me go to the word. The, yeah, let me go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Lord, I pray that um, it's your words that are spoken tonight, that um, people's hearts and their minds are open to listening and hearing what you have to say, Lord. And I pray that the Holy Spirit works through me. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for everyone here. Through your Son Jesus, I pray. Amen. Principle one. We're starting with denial. Principle one, realize I'm not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Happy are those who know they're spiritually poor, Matthew 5.3. Matthew 5.3 is part of the Beatitudes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. When I hear that, when I say that, that makes me want to know more. I mean, if Jesus had to speak, I want to know what he has to say. So why does it line up with principle one? It's easy because God is God and I'm not. I am spiritually poor or spiritually bankrupt without God. Without God, I am. God is our higher power here at Celebrate Recovery. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors and that our lives had become unmanageable. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. That's Romans 7, 18. Far too often in our walk in life, not just our recovery, we think or we say, it's all good, it's all good. Or maybe you puff yourself up with, I got this, like I have in my past. That is one of the biggest things that I was puffed up with for many years because as a younger adult, I was a very insecure individual. So everyone around me, you got this, you got this, and I had that puffed esteem. And eventually I believed that I had it. I did not. So that was me, and and let me tell you, I was far from good. I can recall when a beloved mentor of mine, of course, in a caring way, pointed out the fact that I was full of pride. Oh, no, I was not. How dare he? I remember feeling defensive. But that statement made me take a closer look at myself. Oh, the irony there, that was the last thing I needed. Self was my problem. I wondered how I was prideful. That led me to the word humility. Being humble, I didn't even know what that meant. What is humility? Well, humility means having or showing a modest or low estimate of one's importance. But I didn't think I was important. You know, I I didn't have that self-esteem, or did I? Well, so I tried controlling every aspect of my life. I needed people to see everything Jamie did. I would constantly compare myself to others. Well, why aren't they doing this? Why am I doing this? Why aren't they doing it? I had unrealistic expectations of everyone around me. Then, if that wasn't ugly enough, it was just then that my back was injured. And guess what? I was forced to ask others in my household for help because I could not do the things that needed to be done. And of course, only I could do them right. Did you hear all the eyes? Well, guess what? I indeed was in denial. It was ugly. It didn't feel great. I was embarrassed and ashamed. But it was the start of my recovery journey and my walk with the Lord. It was the start of surrendering my life over to the care of God, in which I must choose to do on a daily basis. So tonight, we begin a journey together, a journey on the road of recovery. This journey begins with principle one, where we admit that we are powerless to control our tendency to do the wrong thing and that our lives have become unmanageable or out of control. But before we begin this exciting journey together, we need to ask ourselves two questions. One, am I going to let my past failures prevent me from taking this journey? And two, am I afraid to change? Really think about that. Failures from the past. Let's look at Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, 
especially the sin that easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has before us. God has set before us. There are two things I would like to point out in this verse. First, God has a particular race, a unique plan for each of us. That's exciting. A plan for good, not a life full of dependencies, addictions, and obsessions. The second thing is that we need to be willing to get rid of all the unnecessary baggage and past failures in our lives. They keep us stuck. Again, it says, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back, and especially the sin that so easily trips us up. For many of us, our past hurts, habits, and hang-ups hold us back and trip us up. Many of us are stuck in bitterness over what someone has done to us. We continue to hold on to the hurt, and we refuse to forgive the ones who have hurt us. You may have been hurt deeply. Perhaps you were abused as a child. Or maybe you were in a marriage where your spouse has been unfaithful. There are too many scenarios in this world for us to mention, but a hurt is a hurt nonetheless. We want you to know that we do hurt for you here. We are truly sorry. And it stinks that you even had to go through it. But holding on to that hurt and not being willing to forgive the person who hurt and hurt you in the past is allowing them to continue to hurt you today in the present. Working this Christ-centered recovery program will, with God's power, allow you to find the courage and the strength to forgive them. Now, don't get all stressed out. You don't have to forgive them tonight. You all are off the hook there. <laughs> But as you travel on your road to recovery, God will help you find the willingness to forgive them and free, and be free of their hold on your life. Some here tonight might be bound by guilt and you keep beating yourself up over some past failure. You're trapped and stuck in your guilt. Maybe you think that no one anywhere is as bad as you are, that no one could love the real you, and that no one could ever forgive you for the terrible things that you have done. You're wrong. God can. That's why Jesus went to the cross for our sins. He knows everything you've done and everything you've ever experienced and everything you will do in the future. There are many here tonight that have faced similar failures and hurts in their life and have accepted Christ's forgiveness. They are here to encourage and support you. The Apostle Paul had a lot to regret about his past. He even participated in a mur murder, Stephen's death. Yet in Philippians 3.13, he tells us, no, dear brothers, I am still not all I should be, but I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. The bottom line is if you want to be free from your past hurts, habits, and hang-ups, you need to deal with your past bitterness, guilt, once and for all. We should be willing to do as, I, uh, yeah, as Isaiah instructs in Isaiah 43:18, Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. It's like when you're in a vehicle, right? You have a rear view mirror. How tiny is that rear view mirror compared to the windshield? It's because we're not supposed to be looking backwards. That doesn't mean ignore the past. We need to learn from our past, offer forgiveness, make amends, and then release it. Only then can we be free from our guilt, grudges, and grief. Let's face it, we have all stumbled over a hurt, habit, or hang up. I know I have, all three. But the race isn't over yet. God isn't interested in how we started but how we finish this race. So looking at the future, fears for our future. Do you find yourself worrying about your future and are maybe afraid to change? We all worry about things that we do not have control over and we all know worrying is a lack of trust in God. The truth is we can say without any doubt or fear, the Lord is my helper and I'm not afraid of anything that mere man can do to me. That's Hebrews 13.6. You may have had a hurt habit or hang up for so long that it's become your identity. I remember for me, that was the case. Um, I lived in chaos for majority of my life and if I didn't have chaos, I didn't know what was normal and I actually would create my own chaos because that's what I was used to. So you might be wondering, what will happen if I really give recovery a chance? Will I change? If I give up my old hurts, habits and hang ups, what will I become? Who will I be? What will this change me be like? Maybe you've been abusing alcohol, prescription drugs, 
food or afraid of what you will do without it. Or maybe you have been enabling someone in a dysfunctional relationship for years. You may be worried thinking, what if I change and my alcoholic husband gets mad at me? Well, God doesn't want you to stay frozen in an unhealthy relationship or a bad habit. He wants you to do your part in becoming healthy. Even, our pa- even if our past was extremely painful, we still may resist change and the freedom that can be found in really working this program. Because of our fear of the unknown or because of our despair, we just close our minds because maybe we think we don't deserve any better or believe that it's just easier that way. As you work the principles and the steps, remember 1 John 4.18. Where God's love is, there is no fear, because God's perfect love drives out fear. You're not here tonight by mistake. This room is full of changed lives. It is my prayer for each of of you that you will not let your past failures or your fear of your future to stop you from giving Celebrate Recovery a real try. So are you, are you wearing a mask tonight, the mask of denial? Before you can make any progress in your recovery, you need to face your denial. As soon as you remove your mask, your recovery begins or begins again. It doesn't matter if you are new in recovery or have been in recovery for a long time. Denial can rear its ugly head and return at any time. And just a side note, transfer addiction is real. Is getting rid of one addiction and finding yourself in another. I've been there. I traded food addiction for alcoholism. Same problem, different substance. This lesson is for us all. None of us have made it to the finish line yet. There will always be something we can work on, things we can do better in our walk with the Lord and others. So what's denial? Jeremiah 6.14 says, All is well, all is well, they insist, when in fact nothing is well. Denial has been defined as a false system of beliefs that are not based on reality, and a self-protecting behavior that keeps us from honestly facing the truth. As kids, we all learned various coping skills. They came in handy when we didn't get the attention we wanted from our parents or others, or we wanted to block out our pain and our fears. For a time, these coping skills worked, but as the years went on, they confused and clouded our view of the truth and our lives. As we grew, our perception of ourselves and our expectations of all those around us also grew, but because we retained our childish methods of coping, our perceptions of reality became increasingly more unrealistic and distorted. Our coping skills actually grew into denial, and most of our relationships ended up broken or less fulfilling than they could have been. Really think about that. Did you ever deny that your parents had problems? How about did you ever deny that you have a problem? The truth is, we can all answer yes to these questions to some extent, but for some of us, that denial turned to shame and guilt. Denial is the pink elephant in the, in the room sitting right in the living room. No one in the family talks about it or acknowledges it in any way. Are any of these following comments familiar to you? Can't we just stop talking about it? Talking only makes it worse. I'm sorry, I sounded like a northerner right there. (laughs) Talking. Um, If we don't talk about it, it'll go away. Let's just pretend that it didn't really happen. If I tell them that it hurts me when they say that, they will leave me. He or she doesn't really drink that much. It really doesn't hurt when he or she does that. I'm fine. But he or she she drinks more than I do. If you didn't nag me all the time, I wouldn't eat so much. Look, I have a tough job. I work hard. I need a few drinks to relax. It doesn't mean that I have a problem. Folks, that's denial. Before we can take the first step of recovery, we must first face and admit our denial. God says in Jeremiah 6.14, You can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. So let's talk about the effects. Tonight's acrostic is denial. Disables our feelings, energy lost, negates growth, isolates us from God, alienates us from relationships, and lengthens the pain. The D in denial stands for disables our feelings. Hiding our feelings, living in denial, freezes our emotions, and binds us. 
Understanding and feeling our feelings is where we find freedom. I can tell you firsthand, that's how I was. I literally was a, you can't crack this nut um, kind of girl. That I, I really, my heart was hardened, and I'm just so thankful for this program. Second Peter 2.19 tells us, they promise them freedom why they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. For we are slaves of, slaves of anything that has conquered us. For me, the basic test of freedom is not what I'm free to do, it's what I'm free not to do. That's a big one for me. I'm free, I'm free not to take that drink. I'm free not to make that snarky comment that I just had to say. <laughs> we find freedom to feel our true feelings when we find Christ and step out of denial. The next letter in denial is E, which stands for energy lost. A major side effect of denial is anxiety. Anxiety causes us to waste precious energy dealing with those past hurts and failures and the fear of the future. As you go through this program, you will learn that it is only in the present that positive changes can occur. Worrying about the past and dreading the future makes us unable to live and enjoy God's plans for us in the present. We let our fears and our worries paralyze us, but the only lasting way we can, free, we can be free from them is by giving them to God. In Psalm 146, 7, the psalmist says, he frees the prisoners, he lifts the burdens from those bent down beneath their loads. This may sound harsh. If we only would transfer the energy required to maintain our denial into learning God's truth, a healthy love for others and ourselves will occur. Again, first-handedly, me being in the Bible and me learning about the Lord and what he wants for all of us, his love for all of us, we just, it, it's, it's there. The Bible is right there for all of us to get into, dive into, understand his word, and see what his love is for us, what his love looks like. No one can love any of you like God can in this world. Let's move on to N in denial. Denial negates growth. We are sick as our secrets. We are as sick as our secrets. We cannot grow in recovery until we are ready to step out of our denial into truth. God is waiting to take our hand and bring us out. Psalm 107, 13 through 14 says, They cried to the Lord in their troubles, and he rescued them. He led them from the darkness and, sh and shadows, I'm sorry, and shadow of death and snapped their chains. God never wastes a hurt but he can't use it unless you step out of denial into the light of his truth. The I in denial, denial also isolates us from God. Adam and Eve are a great example of how secrets and denial separate us from true fellowship with God. After they sinned, their secret separated them from God. Genesis 3-7 tells us that Adam and Eve hid from God because they felt naked and ashamed. He said to God, the woman, well, of course, good old Adam tried to rationalize. He said to God, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree. That's in Genesis 3.12. Well, first he tried to blame God, saying, the woman you put here with me. Then he tried to blame it on Eve. She gave me some fruit. I don't know about you, but I surely do not picture Eve holding Adam down and forcing him to bite into that apple. I have no doubt that Adam freely took his bite. Remember, God's light shines on the truth. Our denial keeps us in the dark. 1 John 1, 5 through 7, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Our denial not only isolates us from God, but it also alienates us from all of our relationships. Denial tells us we are getting away with it. We think no one knows, but they do. While denial may seem to shield us from the hurt, it also keeps us from helping ourselves or the people we love the most. We think or say, if they knew the real us, we must protect ourselves, our secrets, at any cost. So we isolate ourselves and thereby minimize the risk of exposure and possible rejection from others. But at what price? The eventual loss of all our important relationships? 
Ephesians 4.25 instructs us to stop lying to each other, tell the truth, for we are parts of each other, and when we lie to each other, we are hurting ourselves. I love this one. Remember, it's always better to tell the ugly truth rather than a beautiful lie. And finally, denial lengthens the pain. We have the false belief that denial protects us from our pain, when in reality, denial allows our pain to fester and grow and turn into shame and guilt. Denial extends your hurt. It multiplies your problems. God promises us in Jeremiah 30, 17, I will give you back your health again and heal your wounds. That's a promise. There's many promises that are so beautiful. So tonight, I encourage you to step out of your denial. Stepping out of denial is not easy. Taking off that mask is hard. Everything about you shouts, don't do it, it's not safe. I felt that way. I was afraid. In all honesty, when I first started coming, when I first started going to church, I'm going to be one of those Jesus freaks. I'm going to lose all my personality. People are going to judge my tattoos. All of this kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to be too weird to be going to church. Guess what? Everyone here that I have gotten to open up to, get all that guilt, get all of that disgustingness out and people see me for the real me has been the most beautiful experience in the world because these are the people that love me. These are the people I love and I am safe. We're safe here at Celebrate Recovery. Here you have people who will, will care about you and who love you for who you are. People who will stand beside you as truth becomes a way of life. Jesus tells us in John 8:32, know the truth and the truth will set you free. Step out of denial so you can step into Jesus' unconditional love and grace and begin your healing journey of recovery. Thank you all for allowing me to speak tonight.